But we are going to go ahead and welcome our, our first guest speaker today, which is Mr. or Pastor John Speed. He is the pastor of the Missions and Evangelism of By the Word Baptist Church in Azel. Is that pronounced correct? Azel? Azel, Texas. He is the author of Evangelism in the New Testament and the co-producer of the pro-life documentary Babies Are Murdered Here and the sequel Babies Are Still Murdered Here. In January of 2019, he went viral for closing his bookstore in pro protest of New York's Reproductive Health Act and went on Fox and Friends, Hannity, and Glenn Beck. John is married to Kim and they have five children, one of which is with him today, this whole conference, right? So let's welcome Pastor John Speed. assignment this evening has to do with um, how we how we do ministry at the abortion clinics and also we're going to talk about like what we did today how you do ministry when you're trying to agitate uh, you had a great thing last night this all just kind of goes together all the principles I'm going to give you tonight apply to both agitation how we do that and also how we do ministry at the clinics um, at this point in the conference, if you don't have a desire to do something, I don't know at this point if I can create it or not in a message. It's going to have to be the work of God. It always is the work of God to mobilize his church and to get them moving on this issue of the slaughter of our pre-born neighbors. Uh, we can't come up with enough words to describe what this is that we're talking about. When we're talking about abortion how how urgent we really need to be when it comes to this after 49 years my greatest fear is that the church has become so comfortable with the idea of abortion that we're just asleep on this thing we're just absolutely you know it's part of the furniture in the room when you go to vote we're talking about taxes we're talking about um, you know, uh, a whole host of, you know, foreign policy, all that kind of stuff. And well, you know, somebody cares about abortion. That's just what we do every few years is talk about that. That's a bad way to be. And um, these three principles will help, I hope, shake all of us out of our lethargy when it comes to this. The first principle that I want to give you, there are three, and I'll just give you the three right off the top and then I'll go down through and explain them. The first principle is lament lament you have to have a certain lament or brokenness over things as they are the second principle is love and the last principle is interposition so lament love and interposition the first uh, text that we're going to look at here is Habakkuk chapter 1 so if you got your Bibles with you Habakkuk chapter 1 verses 1 through 4 this is about lament. Listen, uh, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. The oracle that Habakkuk the prophet saw, O Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear? Or cry to you violence and you will not save? Why do you make me see iniquity? And why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law is paralyzed and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous, so justice goes forth perverted. So you've got this cry from Habakkuk and as the book unfolds, it's a series of questions and answers between the prophet and God. And here, I, I really think the church needs to uh, resurrect this sort of thinking. Um, we ought to be broken when we see sin. We ought to be broken when we see violence. We ought to be broken when we see child sacrifice. This is regarding the covenant people of God. Habakkuk is broken over the sin that he's seeing amongst the covenant people of God. The iniquity that's being talked about here. He's talking about the iniquity of the people of the covenant. 
And he says, destruction, verse 3, destruction and violence are before me. Violence. This is a popular word in Habakkuk. It's only three chapters, but the word violence appear in the Hebrew appears seven times. So violence is a major issue. You have to understand that Habakkuk is a contemporary of Jeremiah. Jeremiah, when he's talking about violence and Habakkuk, they're the same, about the same time period. They're talking about child sacrifice. If you don't believe that, you look at Jeremiah chapter 7, and you've got all the reference there to, to Molech, and the sacrifices that the covenant people of God are making of their own children to Molech, a false god. So Habakkuk, I believe, is talking about the same thing here. Whenever you're reading about violence in Jeremiah, you talk about bloodshed and murder in Jeremiah, you're talking about child sacrifice. And when you're talking about it here in Habakkuk, you're talking about the same thing. So this is inside and not outside the church. The problem is, like, if, if you're here in the Bible Belt, you go to an abortion clinic, what you're going to see there is you're going to see people driving up with Jesus fish on their bumpers. You're going to see people with crosses hanging from their mirrors. You're going to see people with a local Christian radio station bumper sticker or maybe megachurch bumper sticker. And you'll have theological debates with people in the parking lot. You know, like Sabbath keeping. I've had that debate in the parking lot. What day do you observe the Sabbath? Your, your wife or your girlfriend is in there murdering your son or your daughter and you want to talk to me about the Sabbath day. you got bigger fish to fry. You've got a bigger problem than that. And that happens a lot. That ought to bother you. And we ought to have some of this crying out to God, saying, God, why is this happening? Why is this going on? And I honestly, I just don't see much lament. What would it take? What would it take in our day and age? Honestly, right now, ask yourself this question. What would it take to get some urgency about the slaughter of unborn children in our land? Is it possible that God's bringing judgment, not only on the United States, but even on the whole world over this issue? What have we seen in the last couple of years? Pandemic word that I never used in my lifetime. Pandemic, right? Uh, global economic problems, supply chain issues. Anybody ever used that before in their lifetime? Um, you know, you can just go down the list. And <laughs> now, currently, well, January 6th, they, you know, there's this riot and all this stuff all about January 6th. You got all this stuff going on, right? And now you've got a war in Russia and Ukraine, at war with each other, and they're actually talking about nuclear weapons. Now, I'm not noticing, I don't know about the other pastors in the room, but I haven't seen a great increase in our prayer meetings on Wednesday nights. We're just waiting for this all to end so we can get used to the new normal. Whatever that is, right? Where is the urgency about things as they are why, are, why isn't the church broken over this stuff? People are, you know, babies are literally dying. And people are dying, by the way, Ukraine, you know, Russians are dying. People are actually dying in war. And, you know, we need to care about people dying. We say we're, you know, we're, we're abolitionists. We want to see this stuff end. We should care about people dying. Can I, is that, you know, am I getting thrown out? I don't know if I get thrown out for that. We, where is that? Where is the urgency? Now, God's answer to the, the question, verses 1 through 4, is found in verses 5 through 11. And the answer is judgment. God says, don't worry, Habakkuk. I am still just. I am still righteous. And I will judge. He says, I will judge the covenant people of God. I'm raising up in verse 6 the Chaldeans that bitter and hasty nation who march to the breath of the earth to seize dwellings not their own. What would it take? Would we repent then? You know, would like an invasion cause us to repent? I'm not, I'm not sure. If they gave us Wi-Fi, we probably wouldn't care. 
we have to have a certain brokenness. Or else, you know, you can't kill 63 million babies and expect God to look the other way on that. We ought to be broken over the state of the church. We ought to be broken over the state of the nation. We ought to be broken over the reality. And if you're not broken, don't go to the clinic. I mean, <laughs> be broken over what you're seeing there. Don't be prideful. Don't be angry. Don't be bitter when you go out there. Be broken. And maybe if there were some Jeremiah's that God raised up, if people could see us weeping for the children that are being slaughtered out there, then maybe they would believe that we really think these, these babies are human. So that's the first thing is lament. The second principle is love. Again, not anger and bitterness, but love. Mark chapter 12. You've all heard this stuff. It's like Sunday school for some that have been in the church for a while. But it's now we need to be reminded of these things, what Jesus taught. I'm using one hand to flip my Bible and I'm not getting anywhere. Here we go. Mark 12, 28. One of the scribes came up and heard him, them disputing with one another, and seeing that, he, seeing that he answered them well, asked him, which commandment is the most important of all? Jesus answered, the most important is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. So the second principle is love. You must love your preborn neighbor. Now we hear a lot about loving our neighbor, loving others. Uh, we need to love enough to do something about it. That's the issue. And so if you're still sitting on the fence about whether or not it's right to go to abortion clinics and reach out with the gospel, I'll add that and emphasize that. It's not enough just to go to the abortion clinic and even offer help, although it's good to offer help. It's not enough to go to the abortion clinic and stand there and just pray, although it's good to pray. But at some point, you have to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because if the, it's, if the gospel is not the main thing when you go to the abortion clinic, we can say that we're there non-confrontationally because we love them. We can say we're there praying for them because we love them. It can be true. But when it, the best thing that you can do for an abortive mom is make the gospel the issue. Because if the gospel is not the issue, you know what's going to happen? You can talk her out of having an abortion. You can show pictures. You can have a model. You know, the babies, the little model, put it in her hands. You can do all that stuff and talk her out of it. My question is, what happens the next time she gets pregnant? If, the, if it's not gospel-centered, she'll be back. Because after all, hey, now I've got another baby at home that I kept last time. And now it's harder for me than it was before because I have another mouth to feed. And so I'm going back to the clinic. We've seen it. We've seen it. The gospel has to be proclaimed at the clinic. I get in trouble for this stuff when I say this stuff. You know, there's a lot of people in pro-life organizations, not everybody, there's a lot of people in pro-life organizations that want to downplay the gospel all the time. This is one reason I'm an abolitionist. is because it's about the gospel. You cannot... You, you, they say we want to change hearts and minds. Pray tell. How does that happen apart from the gospel? I'm not talking about just making a decision on the moment. If you want to really change a heart and mind, it must be the gospel. So you must proclaim it. By the way, not just at the abortion clinics, but in the legislatures. When we go, we you know, support bills of abolition. So we must love people enough to tell them the truth. The most important commandment, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. We must love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We must love our neighbor as we love ourselves. But look at Romans 13 for a second. Romans chapter 13, verse 8. And I want to bring out this point. It says there, Owe no one anything except to love each other. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. This is off of what Jesus was saying. Where it says there, 
owe no one anything except to love each other. In the Greek, what it means is loving, you must love the other. Love the other. And the other means someone who's different from you. And I think maybe the reason why we don't care the way that we should when it comes to the baby in the womb is because the baby's different from us. We can't see him or her. Maybe it would be easier. Maybe more people would care. Maybe more churches would do something and go to the clinics if they could actually see the baby outside of the womb being killed. But now there's things being put forward in different state legislatures like California where they want to actually kill the baby outside of the womb. Will there be any difference if that happens? Will more churches show up? If they do, I have a question. Did you really believe that life in the womb was human life? <laughs> because if you did, you would have shown up then and not wait for it to show up when you can see it. It's one thing to say you're pro-life. But if you really believe that, you will treat the baby in the womb the same way. You won't wait for it to be born before you do something about it. So, do you love your neighbor? You have to love the other. And you just need to, to go in and do something about it. First time I went out to an abortion clinic, um, a guy named Brooks had been going out in Fort Worth at the clinic at South Las Vegas Trail for like 15 or 20 years. Every day since he retired, he was out there every day. And I didn't know what to do other than just go out there. And I, for the first couple of times I went, I just watched. I didn't do anything, I just watched to see what was happening. And finally, uh, Brooks took me out to breakfast one morning uh, after we were there, and he said, John, you just need to pray about what God wants you to do and then do that. And that seemed simple enough to me, so I prayed and said, okay, Lord, show me what you want me to do out there. Well, up to that point, I've been doing a lot of street evangelism, a lot of street preaching. And they said, you know, I prayed about it, and I felt like, well, you know, at the end, there's time I could just preach right at the very end. 15 feet from the door, just stand there and preach the gospel right there to the people in the clinic. Even though I couldn't see them, I know they could hear. Brooks said they can hear you in there because they've testified in court that they can hear me in there. <laughs> so that's how I know. And so um, I did. I just started preaching at the end of that. And when I did that, I thought, you know, man, people in the pro-life world are going to really be happy about that. You know, people are showing up at the clinics preaching the gospel. I'm going to get an attaboy. You know, maybe they'll give me a, a pro-life award or something. I don't know. Go out there and preach the gospel at the clinics. And that was not what I found out. What I found out was they wanted me to be quiet. And many times they made it very clear I shouldn't say anything. I know there's motivations and reasons for that. But I'm saying it's misguided. And true love warns. And if we really believe that they're being murdered out there, then we will be urgent and we will proclaim the gospel because it's the only answer that they've got to, to the question, to the problem. Last word, interposition. <clears throat> Esther chapter 4 is my personal favorite text to look at in regards to interposition. Esther 4, are you familiar? Um, Esther chapter 4, verse 11. All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that if any man or woman goes to the king, well, this is, go back to verse 10. Esther spoke to Athak and commanded him to go to Mordecai and say, All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that if any man or woman goes to the king inside the inner court without being called, there is but one law to be put to death except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter so that he may live. But as for me, I have not been called to come into the king these 30 days. They told Mordecai what Esther had said. Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, Do not think to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, Go gather all the Jews to be found in Susa, and hold a fast on my behalf. 
and do not eat or drink for three days, night or day, I and my young woman will also fast as you do, then I will go to the king, though it is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. Interposition is when you place yourself between the innocent party and the danger. That's interposition. Real simple, Esther committed, I'm going to place myself between my people, the Jewish people, and the danger. Even, even though she's queen, she could be killed for going to the king and asking anything without the scepter being held out to her. And she says, I'll do it. And if I die, I die. How does she do that? Because she knows it's right. And she's willing to die for what she knows is right. She's willing to interpose that way. If you decide to go out to the clinics, I'm not going to lie to you. If you make the gospel your primary commitment out there at the clinic and the glorification of God and helping out your neighbor, if you do it in that order, I can promise you nobody's going to give you an attaboy or anything like that. And in fact, things are getting crazier in, the time, in recent years out there at the clinics. I had never seen a gun get pulled out of me ever in the clinic since 2011 until uh, the first week of the pandemic. And one gun came out, and three weeks later, another gun came out, and then a knife. So it's getting crazy out there. Is it safe? No, it's not safe. I cannot guarantee anyone's safety that comes with me to the clinic. You could die. But you have to know that in the final analysis, that if you lay down your life rightly for the sake of Christ and his gospel, that it's worth it. It's worth it. Do you really believe that? Do you really believe that you're going to heaven when you die? Or is this just something we talk about in Sunday school and church and it's just sort of a theoretical thing? It's not. We know it's true. So be willing to lay your life down. That's what, inter the, F the, what the whole essence of interposition is. And I hope I never see it. I hope my son never gets shot at the clinic. When the gun came out the first time at the clinic, um, I looked over and we all did the wrong thing. Like, when the gun came out, like, we all started heading towards the car like a bunch of goofballs. It's amazing nobody got shot, really. I told my son, my son was out there, Charlie, I said, next time that happens, hide. <laughs> Find, like, a tree or something and get behind it, you know? And um, the next time it happened, people were doing the right thing. They were hiding. So um, that was better. We, got, we improved our reaction on that. But... You know, you have to be ready for it. Now, let me, in conclusion, let me say this. There is one who modeled interposition for us. And we're about to celebrate that interposition here next week. Jesus Christ placed himself between us and the wrath of God. He interposed. God made him who knew no sin to be made sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. The cup that we deserve to drink, Jesus drank. The full cup of God's wrath. Propitiation. He bore the wrath that we deserved. And in exchange, what we receive is the righteousness of Christ. It's the ultimate in interposition. This is a gospel issue. We're talking about interposition. And so we must interpose. We must stand between the threat and those who are seeking to kill the babies as best as we can. And we do it for the glory of God, not for ourselves, not that our names would be made great, but so that Christ would be made known amongst the nations. Let, let the nations know that Christ is king. And let them see that it's true by the way the church reacts when we see slaughter of innocence that we really believe it, and we're willing to place ourselves between them and the danger. All right, so that's what I've got. Let's close in prayer, we'll move on. I think Christine's up next. Father, thank you for your word. We pray that you would help us to lament, that you would help us to love rightly, and that you would help us to interpose. Lord, forgive us for those times we have not done it. Uh, it's easy to get comfortable. It's easy to get just lazy, I guess. Lord, help us to be urgent 
about what's happening. Help me to be urgent about what's going on out there. And that we would not just get used to this, even as abolitionists. It's not just the thing that we do. Real babies are really dying. And the real souls are really going to hell. Help us to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ clearly to those who need to hear it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hug it up, bro. Hug it up. All right. That was, uh, that was a great message. Very encouraging. Thank you again, Pastor John Speed.